Good evening and welcome to another edition of This Week in 60 Minutes. Uh, welcome to those of you joining us on Facebook. Um, your host, Rudy Balgobin. And I am your co-host, Juan Angel Jr. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Yes, on tonight's edition of This Week in 60 Minutes, we'll be dealing Good with evening. the welcome topic, to Continued Misstep by the Coalition Government. Uh, actually, uh, Rudy, we today the uh, the party observed the death anniversary of uh, Michael Ford. Uh, he died at the age of 22 after a package uh, was taken to Freedom House by Emmanuel Fairbairn, uh, who was uh, who was subsequently fingered in the X-13 terror plan. Uh, the party would have uh, celebrated his life because by his bravery, he actually saved many many leaders of the PPP by ensuring that that package was taken to the exit uh, saving lives so today we observe that the PPP the PYO and the WPO they had representatives who laid wreaths at his uh, at the place that he was buried so today we remember Michael Ford and his bravery and what he would have done to save the lives of many many persons Yes, definitely important to remember those who have struggled and went through a lot in Guyana yes. for democracy. Yes, uh, speaking of those who have struggled and went through a lot in Guyana for democracy, yesterday we also celebrated the life of two young men from uh, Barbies who yes, were at the Barbies. time protesting the, uh, the Guyana Defense Force yes. removal of ballot boxes, ballot boxes from, yes. from places of poll. Um, yesterday would have marked 46 years that those comrades laid their life down for the struggle for free and fair elections and for democracy in Guyana. And it would have seemed that here today in 2019, yes. we're heading back to that same um, situation once again, where we are once again involved in a struggle for democracy, for free and fair elections, for the constitution to be upheld and for the rule of law to prevail yes. in Guyana. Now that takes us over to um, current day, 2019. Uh, yesterday, we saw a letter from uh, former Attorney General, uh, Mr. Mobi Ranin Landlal, acting yes. on behalf of the leader of the opposition, where he wrote to Mr. Keith Lowenfield, the Chief Elections Officer of GCOM, yes. urging him and bringing to his attention the orders and the ruling of the, the CCJ, CCJ. Yes. which are also binding on GCOM, yes. and urging him to commence preparation for the holding of general and regional elections on or before the 18th of September 2019. And that is mandated by the Constitution, yes, the of course. That mm -hmm. is not his timeline exactly. or the opposition. Yes. That is uh, according to the Constitution. According to the Constitution, it was further um, compounded by the rulings and orders made by the Caribbean Court of Justice yes. after the recently concluded um, court cases. Yes. So moving on from that position, where we have um, him writing to them. So Just before you go on, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Rudy, uh, we did see that several um, civil society organizations and groups, they have now been calling on this government to call the elections to respect the Constitution. We saw that the International Center for Democracy, uh, the Ghana Manufacturing and Services Association, mm -hmm. and just today, this afternoon, I saw a press statement by the Private Sector Commission, mm -hmm. and they have now urged this government to respect the constitution and to call elections. It is basically, and it is, it is clear for all to see, that civil society, mm -hmm. they understand the importance of what would have happened, the no confidence motion which was passed last year, and they understand that the CCJ has pronounced on the matter, the no confidence motion was valid, and so elections are due. And we would urge more Guyanese to continue mm -hmm to uh, stand up for the Constitution, to continue to stand up for democracy and what is right. Mm -hmm. it is no, there is no question about it that elections are due. And it is good to see that, the, that organizations uh, are, are now coming on board to urge this government to do what they're supposed to be doing, which, yeah, exactly. is, which is to honor the Constitution and call elections. Well, as we all know, um, GCOM has been engaged in the fight for house-to-house -house elections. Yes. In fact, I have here with me uh, the official Gazette yes. that was as of 6 o'clock yesterday afternoon. Yeah. This was not published on the website. And what this says here is, um, is the official Gazette an extraordinary order, subsidiary legislation, which is... Um, an order 
yeah. made under the National Registration Act um, in the exercise of the power conformed upon the Elections Commission by Section 6 of the National Registration Act, the Commission make the following order. And this um, was signed by Justice Retired James Patterson. And it says that um, on the 11th day of June 2019, uh, the persons to whom this order applies shall, in accordance with Section 6 of the Act, be registered under the process of house-to-house -house registration with reference to 31st October 2019, and the registration of those persons shall begin on the 20th of July 2019 and end on the 20th of October 2019. Now, just for the um, reiteration of the public, um, we've there, there's a court case yes. in court stopping this. Um, stopping this, that from happening. Yes, court. this uh, court case, as we mentioned earlier here on the show, that <coughs> the Chief Justice asked for additional submissions, and she has set a date in which she would uh, make her decision. Yes. However, with a brief, um, there is another way that the law mandates that yes. updating of the list Which and claims, um, and objection claims and objection i'd have one just read um okay, the, sure. the facts of that for you guys okay the, well the claims and objection exercise and we've been repeating this over and over again but it will allow any eligible guyanese citizen who has reached the age of 18 years old to be registered if their name is not on the voters list it will allow any eligible Guyanese citizen to get a transfer from one voting district to another in the event that they, they change their place of residence. It will allow any eligible Guyanese citizen to do a name change. It will allow for the removal of a dead person from the voters list and it will allow for objections to be made to the name of someone not eligible to be on the voters list. Now, apart from these facts that we see here, I, I would have also seen that a political analyst uh, by the name of Peter Wickham, he would have uh, given an opinion on the, on the list and he said that the list can be used in its present form. Mm -hmm. Now, this is someone that would have been doing work in the Caribbean and he recognizes that the list, mm -hmm. right, in its present form may not be 100% accurate, but mm -hmm. as we just highlighted from the claims and objections, the list can be perfected exactly. just by doing this claims and mm -hmm. objection. So he actually said that the list in its present form can be used for the elections upcoming. And this is in conformity with the chief elections, um, the legal officer of GCOM yes. herself Excellent. saying that That's you know, a, yes. yes. Okay, so the most topical issue that everyone has been um, clamoring about for the past few weeks is the appointment of a new chairman of the Guyana Elections yeah. Commission. Now, since last week we were here, we spoke about that process. We had uh, Mr. Bishop Juan Edgel on the program, uh, who was one of the representatives representing the leader of the opposition in the informal process, and we had a very lengthy discussion. Now, from since then, um, Thursday, there was another meeting the following Thursday, and two persons who were on the active consideration was rejected by the president's reps and they advised that the other one of those persons was uh, rejected and the other one was shortlisted which then brought the five persons to a short list yes. which the president claims that are not unacceptable to him following that the president himself um, the lead the president had a press conference where he um, said that the appointment of a chairman of the Guinea Election Commission could be done as early as Monday. Now, this is Friday, and um, the leader of the opposition, through his representative, Ms. Gail Teixeira, wrote to him and said that if this is truly what the president wants, it's not political rhetoric, then we should meet throughout the weekend and try to hammer out, as the CCJ pointed out, hammer out the, the names, names the to, names so that you can shortlist, yeah. that you have shortlisted. And at, up to that stage, there were five names uh, shortlisted. Yeah. Um, Mr. But they, Harmon, did, they didn't meet over the weekend? No, they, they didn't no. Meet over the weekend. Um, that was sent off on Friday. What subsequently happened was Mr. Harmon replied on Saturday with a letter of his own and says, uh, His Excellency now wishes to suggest for the consideration of the leader of the opposition a short list of two names extracted from the list of eight earlier submitted. Now, um, on this program, I would have pointed out the eight persons um, and their connection to the PNC um, that the president would have um, yes. shortlist uh, put on a yes. list and submitted but, but Rudy, to. But Rudy, I find it quite ridiculous mm -hmm. that the president would submit a list that is not even acceptable to himself. Well, 
That so is what, what is he exactly hoping to accomplish by submitting a list of eight people and mm -hmm. those eight people don't even enjoy his Confident. confidence. Mm -hmm. He doesn't view them as fit and proper. So why exactly would he submit a list? Uh, what exactly is the leader of the opposition <laughs> supposed to do with that list if the list mm -hmm. is not the people who he wants to see as GCOM chair? But very important question because the leader of the opposition himself was not clear on this matter. So they, they wrote to Mr. Harmon, but before we get there, uh, the two persons that he would have shortlisted from his list of eight is uh, Cassandra Owls and Claudette La Bennett. Now, I would have mentioned earlier that Miss Cassandra Owls is a person in her forties, is the daughter of Kesta Owls, a yes. spokesperson for the form of Forbes Barnum led yes. PNC government yes. and advisor to Mr. Barnum himself. Yes. And of course, um, Claudette La Bennett in her late seventies is someone perceived to be very close to the PNCR administration. Yes. Now, those questions that one just highlighted were the exact question everyone was thinking about, yes. including the leader of the opposition. Yes. And so Ms. Gail Teixeira on Saturday again engaged Mr. Harmon and wrote on the leader of the opposition's behalf, where she sought clarity. And, she's, and I quote, she said, as a result, the leader of the opposition is seeking clarity with regards to the status of the five names that were shortlisted. Now, um, there was no other response until Monday, which they then subsequently met on Tuesday, yes, the leader of the opposition and the president. And in a joint statement, it was agreed, and I quote, that from the list of five names shortlisted by the working group, four were found not unacceptable to the president. And as part of the hammering out process, the two names suggested by the president and others as may be necessary, will be discussed further. Now, as it relates to the further hammering out of this process, the teams, a smaller group met earlier today, yes. um, representing the leader of the opposition was uh, former Attorney General yeah. Mohabir Anil Nandlal and uh, PPC presidential candidate, mm -hmm. Mr. Irfan Ali. Yes. And representing the president was um, Mr. Harmon and Ms. Valda Lawrence. Lawrence. And at that meeting, um, the delegates representing the leader of the opposition conveyed to, to that team that the two names, which I mentioned earlier, f that the president suggested and shortlisted, do not find favor with the leader of the opposition. However, the leader of the opposition has submitted four names for the consideration of the president. And tomorrow, those teams will be meeting again to continue talks and try to hammer out so that we can arrive at a list of six that is acceptable to the president. Now, with that said, um, we'll be taking a very short break. And when we come back, we'll be introducing our guests for tonight. Operators? Yes. Stay tuned. I don't think the operators are quite ready. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Unconstitutional, illegal, our democracy is under threat. As of 21 March, the AFNU AFC government is illegitimate. While they fatten their pockets and preserve their privileges, our people suffer. Their failure puts us in limbo and threatens Guyanese jobs, investment, and our future. Mr. Granger, your time is up. You're putting democracy at risk. It's time to respect our constitution. Call the election now. Unconstitutional, illegal, our democracy is under threat. As of 21 March, the AFNU AFC government is illegitimate. While they fatten their pockets and preserve their privileges, our people suffer. Their failure puts us in limbo and threatens Guyanese jobs, investment, and our future. Mr. Granger, your time is up. You're putting democracy at risk. It's time to respect our constitution. Call the election now. Unconstitutional, illegal, our democracy is under threat. As of 21 March, the AFNU AFC government is illegitimate. While they fatten their pockets and preserve their privileges, our people suffer. Their failure puts us in limbo and threatens Guyanese jobs, investment, and our future. Mr. Granger, your time is up. You're putting democracy at risk. It's time to respect our constitution. Call the election now. 
unconstitutional, illegal. Our democracy is under threat. As of 21 March, the APNU AFC government is illegitimate. While they fatten their pockets and preserve their privileges, our people suffer. Their failure puts us in limbo and threatens Guyanese jobs, investments, and our future. Mr. Granger, your time is up. You're putting democracy at risk. It's time to respect our constitution. Call the election now. Unconstitutional, illegal, our democracy is under threat. As of 21 March, the APNU AFC government is illegitimate. While they fatten their pockets and preserve their privileges, our people suffer. Their failure puts us in limbo and threatens Guyanese jobs, investments, and our future. Mr. Granger, your time is up. You're putting democracy at risk. It's time to respect our constitution. Call the election now. Unconstitutional, illegal, our democracy is under threat. As of 21 March, the APNU AFC government is illegitimate. While they fatten their pockets and preserve their privileges, our people suffer. Their failure puts us in limbo and threatens Guyanese jobs, investments, and our future. Mr. Granger, your time is up. You're putting democracy at risk. It's time to respect our constitution. Call the election now. Viewers, good night. Uh, tonight, I'm pleased to report to you on a meeting between leader of the opposition, uh, myself, President Granger, and Joseph Harmon in relation to the selection of the chairman of GCOM. As you're aware, the CCJ would have ruled, and we're in the process of completing uh, all that is necessary to ensure that we have elections within the constitutional time, as has been ordered by the CCJ. We must ensure that our elections are held within the time frame and within the framework of the Constitution. And this is the position of the People's Progressive Party. You will also know that at, at, uh, as of now, we are dealing with a caretaker government, a government that has a very limited reach and one, that's, oh, that, one uh, that its only assignment, basically, is to prepare for the elections. Viewers, my apologies. As you're aware, uh, we had another Patterson moment. Um, uh, power outage and blackouts is an order of the day, and we just had one of that uh, here at the leader of the opposition office, so my apologies. At the time of the power outage, I was uh, about to read the joint statement by His Excellency President David Granger and the Honorable Barry Jagde, leader of the opposition. The President, accompanied by Joseph Harmon, Director General of the Ministry of the Presidency, and the Leader of the Opposition, along with Mr. Irfan Ali, Member of Parliament, met today to discuss the appointment of a Chairman of the Guyana Elections Commission. It was agreed, one, that from the list of five names shortlisted by the Working Group, four were found not unacceptable to the President and two, as part of the hammering out process, the two names suggested by the President and others as may be necessary will be discussed further. The parties agreed to continue meeting tomorrow, Wednesday, the 17th of July, 2019. This is the joint statement by the Leader of the Opposition and President David Granger. So viewers, there we have it. That's an update of the meeting between the leader of the opposition and the president in relation to the selection of the new chairman of GCOM. Let us all continue to work, commit ourselves to the process of ensuring the rule of law is upheld, democracy is safeguarded, and our constitution is protected. All of this must result in all constitutional players fulfilling their mandate and ensuring that the order of the CCJ and the Constitution, which makes it necessary on the passage of the no-confidence no motion for elections to be held within three months, is done. And democracy 
will win in the end, the rule of law will be upheld, and our constitution will be protected. This is the fight all of us must continue now and in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for staying with us. You just heard from the PPP's uh, presidential candidate, Mr. Irfan Ali. He was updating you on the developments uh, with the meetings that he himself and uh, Dr. Barajabdio had with the team from uh, the government side. Uh, with us tonight in studio is, uh, I'm sure, no stranger to many of you. It is PPPC uh, parliamentarian, uh, Ms. Priya Manichan. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight. Thank you for having me. I watch you. When you're doing your week in 60 minutes, I like your program. Oh, okay, thank, thank you, you very much. much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks uh, for being here. Yeah, so welcome to the program, and we get right into it. So early on the program, we were talking about the uh, missteps and the pattern of behavior from the coalition government. Um, we spoke about the push for house to house by GCOM, um, the process uh, as it involves the the appointment of a chairman of GCOM and the delaying of the election is clearly a delaying tactic. Uh, what, what would you say to the viewers um, and your views on these issues? Right. So, you know, to me, this is one of the most, two things, one of the most unfortunate periods in our history because our young people have to relive what our poor parents have gone through. Yes, and I thought we had conquered as yes. a country, and that is, you know, the, the return to democratic norms. Yes, Whether you like yes. it or not, nobody wants to remove from government, but these are processes you all, we all subscribe to. When yes. Granger ran for the presidency, he subscribed to the Constitution Indeed. and all the articles in that Constitution. Yes. When he challenged Donald Ramatar presidency in 2014, yes. he was challenging based on that um, article of the Constitution that allows him to say he has no confidence on behalf of the people in, in the government. And now he uh, now that this has been done to him, he's forcing our young people, he's forcing our older people to relive those painful days of Guyana. He's forcing our business people. You know, I was at a business one yesterday doing a particular, um, getting a particular service. And he said, you know, I can't live like this, Bri. I can't every five years try to figure out what's going to happen with my business. So he has actually taken a decision to down staff and hold. Right yes, now, every time indeed. something like that happens, that's one business, a business that is hiring 250 persons yes. that is paying a significant amount of, ta amount of taxes every month. Every time a business does that, this whole country suffers. And so the Granger administration will go down in history as one of the biggest disappointments this country ever saw. People who would not ordinarily have done that took a risk and lived in modern, changed Guyana and voted for him. Yes. and his government and this is what they've brought us to and it is unforgivable it is not something people will forget about him and this will be his legacy him mm -hmm. and all his ministers this will be their legacy indeed i don't see anything that they have done that we can point to mm -hmm. to say well you know jack Dale's legacy was for example debt relief and the lcds and putting us on um giving us international recognition about the resources our country mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. Uh, you know, so pe different people have different legacies. What is going to be his fighting against democratic norms, yes. holding on to power, Indeed. coming up with all kinds of excuses, mathematical um, <laughs> abnormalities, mm -hmm. and, and you know, you appoint a dual citizen, and then you're questioning whether he can make a vote. All these things are just, you just come over as a crook. Um, as, a crook. as a lawyer, um, what's your take on what's happening at GCOM? Um, and here, here, but you know, here. you don't even need my 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 um, opinion as a lawyer. The CCJ has rendered uh, the legal judgment um, mm -hmm. for the government for the country, and the Caribbean Court of Justice is a regional institution. It's it's established and, and by our treaty. Court, and our court. Well, it's established by a treaty of all well, many Car Caricom countries, although only three are are actually uh, using it as their highest court, including yeah. Guyana. And this court has said what GCOM must do. The court has said, look, GCOM, you are not above the Constitution. Yes. You have to comply with the Constitution. And the Constitution says that if, when a government falls in a no confidence motion, and this government has fallen, that's what the CCJ said, mm -hmm. um, everybody must be subject to its provisions. The president is not above the Constitution. The speaker is not above the Constitution. The GCOM, and they specifically mentioned GCOM, mm -hmm. they said implicit in that is uh, including GCOM. Yes. So GCOM doesn't have a choice about whether they are ready or not. GCOM is constitutionally bound 
to hold an election in three months. Yes. And three awesome. months from the 18th of June, the people were very clear about that. The judges mm -hmm. were very clear. So everybody who goes against that, you know, you could do it. You could hold on to power for a couple of months. We'll be judging you. We'll be watching you. That will be your legacy. Carry on. <laughs> yes, indeed. If we can uh, just shift focus a little bit now on cost of living, mm -hmm. um, we would have seen a number of stakeholders in the country affected by cost of living. There are farmers, our, our single mothers, uh, there are taxi drivers, our businessmen, as you were mentioning before. A number of people have been affected by, uh, by cost of living or their standard of living has significantly dipped since 2015. Uh, can you give us a view on this? Or, or what, what is your perspective now seeing where you were working in the previous government? what you had in place before and what is currently happening now. Right. So the Minister of Finance has a, a reason for why his PSIP, the Public Service Implementation yeah. Program, can't um, go on. He says, you know, we don't have enough engineers. Or somebody said, we didn't have any more engineers than you had. We just had an efficient government. We had people who worked, people who didn't close their eyes at 3 o'clock and sleep, <laughs> people who didn't think that this was a party to collect a high salary, yeah. people who actually pushed it. We also had some lazy people, and that's, that's a reality. <laughs> um, in every government, you'll have that. But the problem with this executive government is that they are not, they're here, they've spent since December, from December to now, fighting off holding an election. So they're not serving people. They don't care about if your children go to school, if they could put food in their lunch kits. They don't care this August holiday. How are you keeping them safe? How are you entertaining them? How are businesses going to function if, if people are uh, withdrawing monies? How is this affecting, you know, we have different things happening around the world that will affect the remittances that yes. are coming to Guyana. How are our people going to live when that happens? That's not concerning them. Their concern is right now to scamp and crook their way into staying in office. And so your cost of living will go up, as people have seen. I spoke to a couple. One is a teacher and one is a public servant working in a public service uh, organization. And they used to be able to spend um, one salary and save one salary and they're now spending a salary and a half yes. to be able to live a family yes. of four and that is very telling for and these are not people who eat out a lot these are not people these are regular this is the 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 standard type of Guyanese family who try to live within their means yes. don't live on a loan don't borrow don't don't um owe uh try to you know give their children a decent life but live within their means. And that, that for me is very telling. I know for myself that we are definitely, uh, it's costing us more to live. Yes. And it will. Your electricity bill has gone up by 14%. Yes. Because you now have a 14% VAT attached to it. So I mean, you could say, oh, Priya just saying the cost of living has gone up. We now have VAT. That is calculable. Yes. It has gone up. Your water bill that never attracted uh, value-added tax is now, you know, paying taxes on that. Internet um, services as well. Just me put Internet in services, you're paying taxes on yes, that. Uh, many well. of the, it, the things that we never paid VAT on before, you are paying VAT on it now, which means you got a whole underground economy going on with people saying, I don't want a receipt. Yes. So I don't get a receipt, I don't have to pay that. So you pass it. So we are encouraging people to criminalize themselves and to do things that takes away from their that take away from their dignity just to escape not being able to live in a country that, that they can't afford to live in anymore. So the cost of living has risen. It's not whether we are imagining this. Because when VAT came on, on electricity, people couldn't turn off their fridges and say, Well, you know, I'm not gonna have a fridge anymore. Yes. You'd already been accustomed, become accustomed to a certain standard of life. You have two children going to school. You need to freeze your stuff and put your stuff in your fridge so you can cook it all week and you're not shopping every day. Um, so yes, we, we are, if nothing else you want to argue, those bills have gone up. And they have gone up significantly by 14% for everyone. So. I know you've... Um while you were the former Minister of Education, you would have worked with vulnerable groups, and you, you, if you look at the track record, you've seen that you've done a lot there as well. Um, a lot of policies or help influencing policies um, with you know, vulnerable groups. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
Well, as Juan just mentioned, we've seen increased cases of um, cost of living going up, and there's also increased cases of neglect in social services. Yes. Uh, could you share your views? On you know, the president mm -hmm. recently said, sometimes I see things posted by the director of public information. I don't bother much because I really think he is semi-literate. But um, I, no, I feel strongly about it. I don't mm -hmm. think he's altogether there. And, and it shows in, in the way he uh, carries himself. More importantly, forget what I think about him. His own colleagues and peers mm -hmm. believe he's a total misfit for that office. Mm -hmm. But that's a Minion, junior officer. I don't bother too much when they post things. But I saw the president himself sit at a TV interview and uh, said to a child mm -hmm. interviewing him yes, that I'm his really greatest you. accomplishment mm -hmm. is, you know, he spoke to somebody and the somebody told him that they were not going to come to Queen's College in Georgetown, they were going to stay at Anna Regina. When the child asked him, so what do you think is your greatest accomplishment in education? He said, the fact that we've equalized education and this child is staying at Anna okay. Regina. That is a man out to sea. First of all, you're only, you've only been there four years. Mm -hmm. there, there's very little that changes in your education cycle in four years, if he doesn't know. But, but more importantly, this is a president who does not understand what he's talking about. We had a girl in 2012 from um, Abram Zul mm -hmm. on the Essequibo Coast yes. that topped the Caribbean at CXC. So Excellent. five years before Excellent. 2012, in 20, was five years before, 2008, mm -hmm. she chose not to come to Georgetown to go to school because Anna Regina had already <laughs> equalized education. In 2014, I believe it was, we had a child who topped the Caribbean called Yogita Fasad with um, 20 grade ones. She Excellent. went to Anna Regina. She Excellent. had topped the country five years before that and stayed, topped the country at Common Entrance and GSA, and stayed in Anna wow. Regina. So that's not a president's accomplishment. That's not an APNU's accomplishment. In fact, in fact, I want them to go and speak to the teachers at Anna Regina. Go and speak to them and hear how they're struggling to keep the standards they've established there because of small things like procurement issues in their labs, yes. because of issues like teachers not getting what they used mm -hmm. to get before and feeling extremely despondent. Yes. So when he says things like that, that that's when you realize it's this, this fella is, is totally, totally out to sea. That's not your accomplishment, Mr. Granger. That is an accomplishment that has been there long before you. And to sit and boast about it is as dishonest as saying um, on the 8th of July that you expect uh, the, the leader of the opposition to submit names to you that were on the three lists that he had submitted before, and then on the, t or the 4th of July saying that, and then on the 12th of July saying, we don't know why he submitted these names again. They were already we, rejected. We saw the video. We so, saw the video. So this is a person who has come to... Um, be known to us as somebody who well, we can't really trust his word, and that's always a dangerous thing. Your president, at least, you should be able to trust. Yes, um, you actually went into my next question about the regression of the education sector. Right. Um, can you point to some specific? You know, so let me say of, this. And, and some specifics. Right. Politically, I'd like to sit here and tell you the education sector has regressed because that suits our narrative or that could suit our narrative, but I won't tell you that because it's not true. What happens with education is we were on a trajectory, right? We had a five-year plan, and once that plan kept getting implemented, we'd see our schools doing better. Every single thing this government boasts about, we left them in place. So I see they had a, something looking like a pie chart and said they now have 300 more places in primary schools. Those were primary schools we had identified that needed to be built and had funded. They said they had more places in high schools. That's money we got from uh, the PPP civic government, applied for, put up the proposals, did all the wrong work for and got from the World Bank mm -hmm. a $10 million secondary improvement project. That's us building those schools in Parfait Harmony and Grove. You came in and you found it. They would be unable to access money like that because they wouldn't be able to put up a project proposal. It would be Nicola doing it, Miss Henry, the Minister of Education. I doubt that she'd be able to function in that regard. Um, they said they brought in universal secondary education in Region 8. That's us building Cato. Sure. Cato yes. had some <laughs> issues, uh, yes, admittedly, but yeah. they contracted yes. doing some crappy work. Yes. and. 
and the person who was uh, supervising it all off off site. There were not ministry personnel. Mm -hmm. There were people who bid and won a bid through a public procurement process, according to the laws. And um, so that didn't actually get get commissioned, and that was an upset well, for under, us. Under, 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 under. Mm -hmm. So all of these the things government. were done by the PPP. So the, the president and the APNU have done nothing special for education. If you look at their articles that show very clearly, um, not guy local articles, international articles about how we were reducing the number of dropouts and so on. So that was only going to get better over time, which it has, has gotten. Which is something better. they're boasting that they did now. Uh, right, so they Brazil. didn't because, and you know, the problem, and that is the problem. If you think you did so well, and you think people know you did so well, so you can sit on TV and say whatever you want. Everybody, people know what has been happening and what is not happening anymore. People know those internal struggles about having to buy things like chemicals for their children to use in labs to prepare their SBAs. They know that. But here, look, if you think you did so well, go to the election. Indeed. Name the date. Indeed. Name the date. Let's have the election. And if people felt the impact of your beautiful service that you promised them, they'll vote you back in. Yes, but I just want to say this. I was attending uh, the University of Ghana when mm -hmm. uh, President Granger, well, then uh, Mr. Granger, he had attended and he was, he was campaigning, of course. And he was saying all of the issues that uh, UG had at that, at that point. But now we see a few years later, tuition has increased 35% in some cases, making it quite difficult yeah. for persons to, to be able to afford uh, the university level education. Uh, do you have any perspective on that specifically? On, well, on the, the whole issue is uh, everything that they promised. This and of is course, the same sorry, and of course the law school that uh, they said that they right, would <laughs> <laughs> right, which is not going to happen. That's but yes. but everything that was promised by the AP and UAFC government has almost fallen through. Well, not almost. Everything, we, we can't find the promise they made that they kept. So mm -hmm. they couldn't put up ads and so on, but people feel impact. So you're talking about a 35% increase. But imagine that 35% increase for a man who has now lost his job, so he can't support his son or daughter going to UG because he got knocked off of the estate. That's yes. a reality for 30,000 people yes. who lost their jobs. And then, in addition to losing your job and having this child now at UG, you got to be a VAT on all these services. Your taxi fare has gone up. Your mm -hmm. electricity has gone up. Your phone bill has gone up. Internet services have gone up. That is the reality our people are living. And it's unfortunate that, that, that he's not seeing it. My Facebook page... Um, reminded me that a couple of years ago the president said very shockingly he wasn't president at the time he was opposition leader you know I'm very rarely speechless but I was actually speechless at that he said this is from his lips this is not someone prompting him that we were engaging in education apartheid and what he had done mm. was watch the faces of the children who were passing common entrance or, or doing well in his view and said that we were engaging in education apartheid. Now, this is always a very difficult and painful topic to discuss because yes. apartheid means one thing, that we, it, it's always only ever been used across the world to distinguish between es ethnicities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so he looked at these little children and didn't see little Guyanese children. He saw little children of a particular ethnicity. Here, four years later, what has changed? What has changed? Mm -hmm. Nothing has changed. The issue is, it's not that little Indian children are doing well or little uh, red children or little yellow children. These are little Guyanese children. And we must examine what their story is to see how we can multiply that across um, social sect across social class, across economic um, barriers, across private and public schools. That's what we have to do. I mean, I've never seen a child and define them by the way they look. This is a child, this is a Guyanese child. The issue is simply because of our numbers, as Henry Jeffrey pointed out later on in an article, based on that same education apartheid thing, that because you have more of a particular ethnicity, more will do well, but more will also do worse. In the last yes. bracket, in the, in the people who are getting last, you'll have more of that ethnicity also. It's just a statistical, geographic, demographic kind of um, figure, but he was not ashamed to say it. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying racism doesn't just stop. Mm -hmm. It doesn't just stop. That's always something for me. If you can see this in your heart, then oof, like I didn't even see that. If you're seeing this, then we're like very different people. Mm -hmm. And that does not just stop.
So, yeah. Um, before we move into our next topic, which um, is very much on the minds of everyone, as the former Minister of Education, we recently had students completing uh, NGSA. Mm -hmm. um, to those students, uh, what would you like to say something to them? Well, th you know, I'm always extremely pleased. We see <coughs> children who do fantastically, and it's not always the children you expect to do well. So those, mm -hmm. that's so to all the kids who wrote NGSA, I am saying to you that we have um, six to something million children across the world who never reach where you have reached, mm -hmm. which is yes. completion of primary school. A lot of those are girls. If you got there, you're already a winner. Now, what we have not been able to do as a country properly is to say to you that wherever you go, um, you can do well. We, the PPP Civic moved away from uh, QC and Bishops being the best schools. And we were getting results from Brigdam and Central and Anna Regina and Multi, um, New Amsterdam Multi, Christianburg and those kinds of schools. Like 95% pass rates. If you got those schools, you didn't get QC, you're doing fine, you'll do fine. Just put your head down and do your work. Um, but, but there were lovely stories to be told yes. where you saw children who weren't all the high flyers yes. all the time coming mm -hmm. forward and really performing. So I'm saying that to the children now who are getting into something and early 90s percent, you could come and, and be whatever you want to be and do whatever you want to do. And so I'm, I'm very pleased that the results came out the way they did. They don't look or aren't very different from results we got yes. in previous years. You see private schools doing better. For me, private schools host Guyanese children, so I don't mm -hmm. care. But we should examine why. It's mm -hmm. not, we're not teaching them different. The teachers mm -hmm. are not from space. Mm -hmm. They're from <laughs> the same Guyana teachers training college, mm -hmm. Sarah Potters. Um, the, the children didn't come from a particular place. They're the same children we have. So what are the things that we have to speak frankly about some of those things? We have more involved parents in the private schools. And then we also have parents who don't care. They think you drop your child off and you pay and that's enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Parents are a little bit more involved. The discipline is better. So we can't throw, you can't throw children out to the public schools. Mm -hmm. But if you come late and you're refusing to come early, a private school could ask you to leave. So the discipline is a little bit better. And the teachers, um, if the teachers don't perform, they, get, they have to leave. There's no yes. union protecting them. Indeed. Whereas mm -hmm. you have, I was talking to um, a, a girl who does nails today. She was actually doing my nails. And she said, okay. um, <laughs> yeah, you know, she said her daughter moved from, uh, getting second in the class is seven to something percent. I said, well, didn't they call you? This is a public school. And she said, no, nobody ever called her or told her anything. I mean, that's a teacher failing. If your child is going to move from performing very well to not performing as well, with such a big gap, then you need to call and yes. find out, you know, see, mm -hmm. examine, check. But that would be a teacher who is interested to, yes. to see what's going on. So um, congrats to all those children. They, they've done very well. Thank you. All right, so moving to our other um, thing. Uh, I know you're a member of the PPC Manifesto Committee. Yes. And um, I have here a precursor of what the Manifesto Committee has been working on, just to share with the viewers briefly. Uh, the very first one relates directly to you, as a matter of fact. Um, the PPP is promising the restoration of the 10,000 crash cash grant to school children, uh, the reinstate of the water subsidies to pensioner, which we were speaking about earlier, yes. reversal of VAT on essential services, including water, electricity, health care, mm -hmm. removal of VAT on data, as one mentioned earlier, and those are just a few of the things. Um, now, can you give us an update as to how this is progressing and some other promises uh, maybe directly right. relating to So, So with education. the manifesto committee, well, what we had to do these are never committees for the PPP. We could make every promise in the world. We're in opposition, whatever. But we know, and we've always known, that we are going to be the next government. And so our promises have to be real, and they have to be promises we could, um, we could keep. Mm -hmm. And so we sat down and very strategically looked at what are the big issues affecting people's daily lives. How is it we can bring you back to, as a family, as a worker, as a mother, as a teacher, as a public servant, as a family unit, as a community, as a country. How could we take our people back to a place where they're living, um, they're living, mm -hmm. they feel confident about being able to invest, being able to um, plan some predictability as to what will come and what won't come uh, in successive budgets and so on. That's what we looked at. We have decided very firmly 
that the issues that are causing hardship now, for example, the VAT on all the uh, utility services, mm -hmm. that's going to be removed. Uh, rest restoration of the $10,000 cash grant, because we know how, how helpful that was to parents. That will go over time up to $50,000 a child, so it doesn't end at 10. That was yes. the initial yes. uh, plan anyway. We All those things like um, the, the VAT on removing VAT right. on exports and the tires that are extremely costly and the vehicle age limits, the age okay. limits and so on all of that will be reversed because that will bring us back to a place where we're not engaging in only rich people or only a certain set of people could live a good life in Ghana what we want is for people to live um, for our middle class all our families the majority of our families to be able to live a life that, that allows them dignity and um, to feel like they're a part of Guyana. So it's divided into um, economic services. What are we going to do for the economy? What are we going to do for the social services? How are we going to make sure rights are protected? Rights of minorities, Amerindians, um, people from the uh, women, children, people from the LGBTQ community, um, making sure that rights are uh, uh, and, and enjoy a high place on our agenda. Um, those are some of the segments we're looking at this if infrastructure how are we going to make sure that people who are have now gone into the housing developments can travel to work and so on quickly efficiently safely how are we going to make sure more families because we gave about a hundred and ten thousand families their own house lot which yes. didn't only provide a home for them I mean it sounds like a small thing it provide gave them capital they could go to the bank now and yes, mortgage and that and get some yes. money, buy a car, keep improving their lives. They could will it to their children. Mm -hmm. Long ago, only rich people live a will because nobody else ain't going to leave in a will. Now, more of our families can. I don't think this government has given out 3,000 house lots in all the time they're there. And one, of the 300 even. one of the promises of the BP is over the first five year period is to increase it to 50,000 house lots. Uh, right. And, and 50,000 jobs. Well. Right. And it's because it's, it's how it will be spread out. So it's not mm -hmm. wild promises because we, we are very aware that the last thing I would want to do is be like this government. You stand up on a podium, you make a promise, and you're unable to keep it when you get into office. So you won't see wild promises coming from the PPP. You're not going to see that the moment the first barrel of oil comes up, each person is going to yes. have $2 million in their bank account. And so Because those are not promises we can keep, especially given the fact that this government has already spent about the first three years of our oil money by yes. putting themselves and the country in debt. Yes. yes, I would just like to say though, and this is going back to the whole uh, consultative process that the PPP is always engaging in, which I must say is something that I, I really admired. Uh, because when the opposition leader had to present his list, he held uh, consultative meetings with uh, the, the white section uh, society in Guyana. So the manifesto committee, you guys, I know you have met with a few a uh, few groups, uh, religious groups, yeah. social groups. It's not a few groups. Uh, we had a huge so meeting. Um, yeah. First of all, as we go out, we yes. come back in. And it's not a quiet committee. <laughs> so let me just say that. It's a committee that has robust debate with, with mm -hmm. people saying, let's do this. Or one member saying, let's, I'd like to see this happen. I'm going to say, well, you can't do it now. So, so let's so be careful about how we promise that. But, right, but, to but outside of just mm -hmm. the committee members, yes. we met with a wide stakeholder at different forums, yes. wide stakeholder forum that. where we mm -hmm. had business people, housewives, teachers, uh, yes. people from the religious groups, um, women, Amerindian leaders, as well as uh, members of the population, just, just farmers, mm -hmm. just about everybody hearing from them, what are your problems, what do you like to see us do? And that helps us to craft what we will put forward. We're not making policy for us. We're making Excellent. policy mm -hmm. for the people of Guyana who are looking to us for good leadership. And that's how we've always done it. Even <coughs> going out now to bottom house meetings and, you know, these, this government has fired sugar workers, but I don't believe they ever once stopped, went to a sugar worker's home and said, how are you managing? How are you coping? All right, we can't give, we have said, we're giving you back your job. So all these sugar workers are going to be um, re-employed at these reopened estates. But they have not once gone to say, how, how are you coping? If I were Minister of Education and my government had been 
heartless enough to shut down three estates and put three seven thousand people out of office you know what i would have done i would have gone into those areas specifically and said we're going to give lunch to each of these children all the children of these that are coming out of these homes you're going to get lunch and i want to make sure you don't have to buy a single thing for your book bag not a textbook not an exercise book because although the ministry gives sometimes you have to supplement mm -hmm. so that's how you'd have made sure that at least the children are fine right um the government could have said these communities don't pay your light though mm -hmm. for a little bit till we figure out what's happening to you yeah. they never went and asked we did we have we have engaged all these people we've never ducked even when we were in government ducked and run and hide from any difficult issue it was always with the people so that we crafted so. these policies. So you know, it's a little known fact. I could tell you for me, I mean, I didn't spend a full term at education because we were uh, ousted because of the same no confidence, uh, the utilization of the article in the um, constitution for no confidence. We didn't fall by way of a no confidence. The president at the time, President Ramadar, had prorogued parliament to give the parties a time to talk mm -hmm. and then that didn't work and he called the elections. Mm -hmm. But the, in, at, at human services, every single promise that we made in the manifesto, every single one, without exception, we fulfilled. Yes. We fulfilled. And that means, you know, that sounds like we fulfilled the promise. What does it mean when we put a family court up and families who find themselves in conflict, which is not something we want. But if you're going to break up, then let's do this in a civil way so the children come out of this mm -hmm. um, whole and healthy as, as far as we can make that happen. What does it mean when we say to our victims of rape, um, here, are, here are some new laws that will make sure the perpetrators get punished. Mm -hmm. Not only that you will be better, but that they're not on the road harming other people, that a message is being sent to society that the country is not going to, to accept this. When we say we're going to uh, do a, a, an economic program for single parent women, we did the Women of Worth program. Yes. What does that mean is that people who had no house to go and mortgage at the bank, could come and have a collateral free low very low interest Excellent. loan where yes. they could start businesses and or expand their businesses so, so well. it's it fulfilling these promises is not just so that we could check a box it's so mm -hmm. that we could impact lives positively Excellent. so that this whole country could come up and you saw it you saw yes, the really. effect of that in 1991 yes. the world bank this is not Guyana, the world mm -hmm. bank an international financial institution did a study on us and they said then that um, six to something percent, I think it was six to three percent of our people were living in poverty. Mm -hmm. That's the World Bank. Six to three percent of Guyanese. That means out of every hundred Guyanese, six to mm -hmm. three were poor. Yes. In 1998, they, in 2008, they did a, the same sort mm -hmm. of study on us. And they said that we had reduced our poverty by half. The people who were living in poverty were reduced by half. So we had a 30 something percent. And by the time we left office in 2015, it would have gone down significantly. Excellent. The point I'm making is that these policies, when we fulfill promises, they go towards improving people's lives. They come out of poverty. Their children well do better. They, mm -hmm. Their health care standard is better. Um, their lifestyle, we, we improve the life expectancy from we moved it from six to something years old to seven to one years old. So people people were doing better and it yes. showed in all I'm, these I'm, I'm statistical sure, I'm sure, studies. I'm sure our viewers our viewers are, are recalling a lot of what you're saying, uh, Ms. Money. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they, we made mistakes. People make yes. mistakes. So we didn't go as fast as we wanted to go sometimes because you have all yes. kinds of things Indeed. happening. But I could say for sure that we went far faster in any given year than this government has done in all four combined. Well said. Well well thank said. you so much. Yes, for, um, we do. We do. We yes we've you. unfortunately <laughs> run out of time, the operators. Yes frantically waving. Yes. Uh, so, so tonight we covered uh, the continued missteps of the coalition government and just to wrap up my point I want to uh, encourage our viewers and those that will see this video to continue to uh, express your political views, continue to express your social views and not be deferred or discouraged by anyone who would want to attack you or label you according to how they feel. I know that we are coming up to election season and I've seen a lot of this being done. But I just want to encourage our viewers to continue to let your voice be heard and not allow anyone to defer you. Well, thank, thank you again for being on the show. Um, hope you don't be a stranger. No, <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me. I'd yeah. love to come back. And great. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being with us for the last hour. Uh, have a good week and hope to see you guys next week. See you. Bye.
He support Donald Trump, given some of his you know, racially inflammatory rhetoric. The producer came to my office and he said, listen, I want you to look at this first.